Jesus is the light. Once I was blind, praise God, there was a but after that, but now I can see. Amen. Well, let's uh, ask God's blessing on the service tonight, and also let's be lifting up Sister Sarah, Sister Sarah Pooter. She's on her way, probably is there now, uh, there in, at the ER. Um, she's having fevers and a lot, a lot of pain and difficulty breathing tonight. Uh, she's struggling with cancer, for those of you who don't know her. So let's lift her up before the Lord right now. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for this evening. Thank you for those that are here. We're asking your blessing, Lord Jesus, on the service tonight. May you get the honor and glory for it. Please bless Brother Byers as he preaches. Thank you for him being here. Thank you for the, our guests being with us. And Father, we want to lift up to you Sister Pooter. Father, she's struggling right now uh, with not being able to breathe properly, with uh, pains and, and fever. Father, would you just touch her body and heal her right now from these, uh, these things. And Lord, we're asking for, for healing from the cancer as well. Would you please touch her and do a miracle for her and for, for all of us at this church, Lord? Would you please take the cancer away? Father, please bless tonight as we look to your word. Bless Brother Byers, give him the words to say, and fill him with your spirit, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we ask, amen. You may be seated, please. Turn with me to 424. 424, Jesus is the light of the world, and as Christians, we then need to send, the, send out the light. Send the light. 424. Thank you. 
second. Ladies, sing the second. We'll, we'll all sing the chorus together. Ladies. Good to have Brother Byers and his family again with us this evening. We are taking up a love offering for them tonight, so everything that comes into the love offering spot, whether it's designated or not, will go to them. And if it goes into another spot, would you please put it in an envelope with their name on it or Anchor Baptist Church or some such thing like that, and we'll get it to them tonight. Also, after we're done, uh, later on uh, at 8 o'clock or so, we have some refreshments. There's about uh, 72 donuts over there. I may have undercounted. Anyway, kids, be sure you take one donut until everybody's gotten a donut. All right, so there's donuts and coffee and milk over there uh, after church is over so we can have a time of, of refreshment. But I, I want to turn it over to Brother Byers right now. And, Brother, do what the Lord has laid on your heart to share with us tonight. appreciate Pastor Seely very much, and he's been a friend, and I appreciate the Beaver Falls Baptist Church. It's a great church. It's hard to find. It's a great church. you got to be in the right spot, you know, to find this place. We, the plants are visiting with us from Texas, and uh, they're not used to all this winding roads and finding your way through the, you know, over the river and through the woods, you know, to uh, Klatsk and I. But we found it, and it's a sweet little spot, and we're glad to be here. And uh, those that uh, just maybe by way of reintroduction, my, my name is Kevin Byers, and I'm the pastor at Anchor Baptist Church, and you're missionary to the city of Astoria, and we've been at it for a while. We appreciate your support, and uh, we appreciate your prayers, and uh, we love you very much. And I'll introduce now my, my wife, Stacy, Honey, if you could stand, and uh, my son, Gabriel, 
and I go ahead and stand he, just so you see how big he is. And then Caleb, and then Noah, and Elijah, and Micaiah. All right, so there's my family. Thank you. You can be seated. And then Brother and Mrs. Plant, would you stand? This is Donnie and Helen Plant. They're from Texas, and I appreciate them. Thank you for uh, get to know them. They have taken two weeks of their vacation just to come out here and do everything they can to help us with our third annual old-fashioned gospel tent meeting. And uh, that was a dream that I had in my mind. Uh, the Lord kind of put it on my heart from the time that somebody out in uh, a preacher's meeting I went to in Idaho uh, said, hey, I've got a 40 by 40 tent, and we're using it to start our church out here. And Brother Hensley said, if anybody wants it, you're welcome to use it free of charge. And I thought, well, that's good, and I kept that in the back of my mind. I was over with Pastor Rex Smith over in Kelso, and I went to a meeting there, and he said, brother, is there anything we can do for you in your planning of the church? We're for you. And I said, well, if I had somebody, I said, I want to have a tent meeting. If I had somebody that would be willing to drive out to Idaho and pick up this 40 by 40 tent, then it would really be helpful. And he said, you want a 40 by 60? <laughs> and I said, and how? Yeah, I do. You got one? He said, we got one. And he said, we'll set it up for you. And that, that's how the idea was born, and God just used it. And so we've run this now. This will be the third year to have the Old Fashioned Gospel Tent Meeting. And I want to tell you a little bit more about that tonight. I love Beaver Falls Baptist Church, and I love this church. And uh, this is an, I don't know if you know this or not, this is an unusual church. It really is. I've been in a lot of churches. This is an unusual church. There's no place like this place. And I say unusual in a good way. It's almost like going in a time machine back to what America used to be like when you come to a place like this. Has anybody been through Portland recently? Seen pictures? Don't go there. I'm just take my word for it. This is like a war zone, you know. People with crazy yellow and green and blue hair and flying all kinds of crazy rainbow flags and people are living in tents all over the place. It is really, uh, I think Mexico's better off probably. I don't know. Go check it out. I, you can ask Brother William, but... Uh, our world is really in a mess, and I enjoy coming back to Beaver Falls Baptist Church. Uh, I, I think about Pastor Larry Bond all the time. When I drive by here, I always think about him. When I drive by, I uh, was not able to be at the service for him. My uncle had passed away, and I preached a funeral for my uncle out in New Jersey, and I got to lead my cousin to the Lord out there. Uh, so I wasn't able to be here, but I miss Brother Bond, and he was a friend. I, I'm sure I couldn't miss him as much as you miss him, but I want you to know it's left a hole in my heart, and he was a friend. There, there were a couple of times when I needed somebody, and I called on him. There was one time I called him, I think, one in the morning, and uh, I needed him to help some people, and he jumped right out of bed and ran off and, and uh, helped, and he helped some people that needed him. That, and you, I'm not telling you anything that shocks you. You know uh, that's the kind of man he was, and... There was one time I did something really dumb. Have you ever done something really dumb? And I can't tell you what it was because you all are live streaming the service, so I can't tell you what it was, but it, it was really dumb. And I just needed to talk to somebody, and, I, and uh, you know, he didn't. It was a dumb thing to do. I felt so silly. And uh, he didn't pass judgment. He understood. He empathized with me. He helped me walk me through that thing. And so he was a friend, and I miss him. I miss him a lot. I was honored whenever he had asked for me as he was getting ready to pass away, and he asked for me, and I had intended to come. I didn't want to be in the way. I'm not family, but I knew that whatever he would have to say, I thought it would be very important, and we spoke a lot uh, in, the, in those last days, and so I went there, and we went into his room, and they, they had called me in, so I went in to talk with him. My wife was there, and he began to say something. You know he's having a hard time talking at that time, and so he started to speak, and I I got in real close because I wanted to hear, and he wasn't able to speak very loudly. And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, they've, uh, they've got me on marijuana. <laughs> and he said, no, no, not marijuana. And uh, he didn't mean to say that. He was something about morphine or something. And uh, I figured, well, he, you know, he always has such a good sense of humor. He got a good kick out of things like that. But uh, anyhow, I, I miss him, and I think about him all the time. And uh, you're not going to tell anybody I said that, are you? <laughs> but uh, 
this church has a, a global outreach and it has a desire to get the gospel out around the world. And uh, Pastor Seely has been a friend to us. And it's, it's just a blessing to be able to have folks in the ministry that believe what we believe and to be able to communicate that together to the world. I was touched to see, and I didn't know y'all were doing this when we came, and you've got your envelopes all packed up and your handwriting, your tracks, and what a great opportunity to send those things out. And before you leave today, I hope you'll get one of our flyers. We've handed some of those out. We've got some flyers for the Old Fashioned Gospel Tent Meeting, and we've mailed those out to pretty much everyone in Clatsop County, pretty close. We didn't do Seaside. I've got some pictures tonight that I'm going to have, and if you would just kind of click through those pictures, uh, and I just want to give you an idea of uh, some of the things we've been doing in Astoria as we gear up for this tent meeting. Now, that's not all that Anchor Baptist Church is about, but the tent meeting is a way for us uh, to be able to say, hey, we, we want to meet the community where they're at. And, you know, it's hard to get people to go to church, and it's hard to get people to listen to the gospel. Even as we go to the door, it's hard for people uh, to open up. And so uh, by having this tent meeting, you've got a, uh, you've got a, there's some sharp-looking guys, aren't there? We, we put a f uh, float in the parade this year for the 4th of July parade, and we ran that thing. You can just kind of click through these. There's in no particular order. And so my sister and some of the folks got together from the church, and we put together uh, a float to be able to let people know that the tent meeting is coming. And we've mailed these mailers out to let everybody know. And I think we were well-received. As we handed out those flyers, people just really took them, and they kind of have a festive look to them. Uh, my sister brought out a Shetland pony and a little cart, you know, to pull behind it. And then the goat, uh, she had a goat. I don't know. She said the goat made the horse feel better. And so you had to have the goat with the horse, and the, the goat wouldn't keep up. And so I ended up grabbing the goat and running with the goat to catch up with the horse, you know, down the road. And I figured for sure that PETA was going to call us here pretty soon. You know, we probably offended somebody. But it was just a great way to reach out to the community and let them know, hey, we're here and we're having an old-fashioned gospel tent meeting. And a lot of folks said that they plan on coming. So that's good. Now, that doesn't get them saved just because they come, but it does give them thinking about gospel. And I'll tell you this, a week and a half ago or whenever it was, um, they were protesting down by our post office in Astoria. They were pro protesting the Supreme Court decision uh, that uh, overturned Roe versus Wade. And so they were protesting that. And we took that trailer with the gospel signs and we drove by. Other people were honking and waving at these folks. And we drove by with this big banner in the trailer that said, Old Fashioned Gospel Tent Meeting. And I wish you could have seen the look on these people's faces. They, did, they just got real quiet and they just looked <laughs> as the trailer drove by. They didn't, they didn't know what to do about it. So um, anyhow, this was a great outreach and a great opportunity. And the tent meeting is something where we set up that tent. And people don't know about Jesus, and they don't know, they don't know what's going on with the Bible, and they, they've heard things about what being a Christian is, but they don't know who Jesus is, really. He, he, cuss word, you know, something that they, some name they shout when they hit their finger, but they don't know who he is. And so we're inviting people to come so they can hear the gospel. And I want to encourage you to, to come and visit, and the, several of you have every year. You've come and been to, you know, I understand everybody can't make all the meetings but uh, try to come and, and be a part of it. Uh, that was the view last year, or the, I think the first year. God gave us a wonderful place, a piece of property. We don't pay anything for it. We've got that piece of property right there that we could use, and it's free. It's just a great opportunity, and uh, we don't pay anything for that property. I appreciate you running those slides for us. Is that about all of them? I think that's about it. So just, uh, just wanted to get that in your mind. I, I kind of feel like, kind of feel like I invited myself to preach, and I didn't do that intentionally. But I called Pastor Seeley, and I said, hey, I just want to wonder if I could come out on a Wednesday night and just remind people about our tent meeting, maybe say a word about that. And he said, well, do you want to preach? And I mean, you shouldn't say that to a preacher. You know what I mean? You shouldn't say, do you want to preach to a preacher? Because what do you say? No. You know, if you say no, then well, what are you, a preacher? You know, so you kind of have to say yes. But I, he's very gracious uh, to let me come and to preach. I want to bring something to you out of, first of all, Mark 1, and then Psalm 107, but we'll look at Mark chapter 1, and then Psalm 107. I believe the church was very wise. It had a good opportunity. Uh, uh, I
I know Pastor Bond had talked to me quite a bit about, uh, and I never knew exactly what was going to happen, but he told me that the church was praying about who to call as pastor, and I commend you for your choice. I think you had some great choices, and I think you did a great job, and I think that Pastor Seeley has proven to be the man for the job, and I appreciate him and his, uh, his patience and his zeal for winning souls. And I think he's got a lot of wisdom, and I'm glad for that. And I'm not just saying that because he promised me $100 to say it. I'm saying that. No, I'm just kidding. I like my dry humor. You know, it helps if you chuckle a little bit once in a while to make me think that I'm funny. Mark chapter 1 and verse 17, and then we're going to go to Psalm 107. And I want to challenge you to think in a big way. You know, when you read the Bible, you see a big book. You see God do great things, don't you? Think about with me the greatest thing you've seen in the Bible when you read the Bible. Think about something that you look at and say, that was a really big thing that God did. You know what? Probably the greatest thing, probably arguably the greatest miracle that we see, the greatest work of God that we see in the Old Testament was the parting of the Red Sea. That was the gigantic work of God, an incredible miracle that God did. And I've recently heard a message that, uh, that was preached by Brother Ron Garris of the Rock of Ages Prison Ministry. I don't know if anybody ever heard him preach before. I used to hear him every year. But he preached a message. I found it online uh, about the Red Sea, and it was in three parts. And he went into great detail to describe all that God did in, that, in the crossing of the Red Sea. And we read about that, and our little mind can't even fathom two million people going across the deepest part of the Red Sea. Have you ever thought about this? I'll give you a little bit of what he, he brought out in his sermon. Have you ever thought about this? Going across, if you drained all the water out of the Red Sea, it's a big canyon. You know what I mean? Like, it's deep. And so even if you drained all the water out of the Red Sea, how do you get two million people across it? Have you ever thought about that? And he went into great detail in bringing out of the scripture. How, do you know the Bible says the mountains leaped? You know the Bible says that the, the, the waters saw thee and were afraid. They fled. And the Bible says the waters fled. You know the Bible says the waters lifted up their hands. You know what that means right there? <laughs> Everybody, when someone's pointing a gun at you, that's what you do. Okay? You surrender. All, all these things, not only did God part the Red Sea, but he made the land. He made a land. He had to. He made a land bridge for two million people to go all the way across. And as I'm telling you that, I hope you understand that's not a Disney movie. I mean, God did that for real, for real. He did it. And I think so many times we look at the Bible and we forget there's a real God that does real big things, and we all do it. We, we start thinking small, and really we start thinking, well, what could we pray about that God could actually do? And, and we fall into that trap because we're people and we have little faith. Mark chapter 1 and verse 17. Would you stand together as we read two portions of Scripture, Mark and then Psalm 107, and then I'd like to share something. I think everybody would get something out of it. Mark chapter 1, verse 17, and Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. How many of you know that one by heart already? Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. Just real quick, jump over to Psalm 107. Jesus wants you and me to follow him. He wants followers of Jesus. And you're here tonight because you follow Jesus, right? Yeah. Or because mom and dad said you've got to be here, but hopefully because you follow Jesus. That's why you're here. In Psalm 107, verse 23, the Bible says, They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. I'm going to read it again. They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. They go down to the sea in ships. They do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord 
and his wonders in the deep. They see God do something. They go down to the sea in ships. They do business in great waters. They're out there in the deep part, in a ship. And somehow, out there in the deep part, in great waters, they get to see the works of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the scripture that we'll look at tonight and for godly people doing godly things tonight. And thank you for friends here. And I pray, Lord, now that you'd illuminate the scripture and remind us of some things. And, Lord, help us to do a great job with the promises you've given us. I pray, Lord, for those that may be here and not saved and needing a Savior. And I pray, Lord, that you'd save anyone here tonight who needs to be saved. And, Lord, I pray that you would so stir us in our souls that we would once again be reminded what a great God you are. Lord, that we would be encouraged to go down to the sea in ships, so to speak that we would be encouraged to see the great works that you can do. And, Lord, we will give you the honor and glory. Please help me to preach tonight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. <clears throat> the, these see the works of the Lord. I want to see God do some really great stuff. You'll have, uh, you'll have Sunday school lessons you learn about David and Goliath. You know David and Goliath. You know that story. You, you know about the Red Sea and Mo you know that story. The Red Sea, Moses. You know all about that. And you know, you know about the cross. Jesus died on the cross and he was dead three days. And then you know, on the third day, right, he rose again. So you know, and that, and that was a man who was dead, and he got we we know all that. How many of you believe that really happened though? It really did happen. Good. I hope you're not just saying that because you're in church, but it really did happen. And, and the Red Sea and all of that. And David goes out there with how many stones? He had five stones, right? And, and wouldn't you like to see that? And nobody thought that little boy was going to win. But he did win, and he, he, God did some great things. And all these things we read about in the Bible. And uh, the Bible says, these, They that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord. And his wonders in the deep. Now, there's a story in the Bible about somebody went down into a ship and he went to flee from the, the Lord, from the presence of the Lord, right? The Lord told him to go one place. He wanted to go another place. And so he got down, instead of going where he should have went, he got down in a boat. Does anybody know who that was? Jonah. Jonah. And, and so Jonah, that's the story, right? And, he, and what happened when he got out there in that ship? Then the wind started, right? And the winds and the waves and... And grown men were crying out to their gods and throwing things overboard. And then they finally threw Jonah overboard. And they were grown men, and they were in great fear. And you know, for a, a, a seafaring man, and they only had men that did that job back then. And uh, the, the seafaring men, they're strong. You, you can't be on a ship like that. And it was all wind power, you know. So you've got to pull on those ropes and this. I have a little sailboat, 14 foot. Uh, it's amazing how much power that that wind has when it starts yanking on a sail. I mean, it'll knock you right over. And they, they were in these big wooden ships in the wind, and it terrifies them when they're out there and you can't see anything but water everywhere you go. And where are you going to go? I mean, the wind's coming. It's going to knock you down. Grown men were terrified. And you know what they did? They, they weren't godly people. They didn't believe in the true God, the God of the Bible, but they just called on any old God that would listen. Because they were scared. Grown men, scared. That's a lot of power. Do you know I found out that people that go out in the sea, uh, uh, seamen, they are some of the most superstitious people you ever meet. They have a lot of superstitions. My, I have a brother that went out and worked with the um, offshoremen. And he told me that one day he was going in the galley. You know, that's the, the kitchen and the ship. They call it a galley. And he went in there and he said he put a glass in the, in the cupboard and he put it upside down. And he said a guy almost threw him physically off the boat over that. He was so angry. And, and he said, why are you so upset that I put the cup upside down? He said, because that cup will try to right itself. And when that cup tries to right itself, it'll flip the boat over. Yeah, and you're laughing, but he wasn't laughing. He was going to kill my brother because that's how superstitious seafaring people are. 
it's, it's well known that, that there's a lot of bad luck and good luck and on these omens and the albatross and all these things. And they're, they're, some of them, yeah, but there's a lot of them that are not superstitious over it. And, and the Bible says they that go down to sea in ships, they see the works of the Lord. In other words, they know that I'm in the hand of providence. I'm in the hand of, I can't control the sea. The sea is in charge. It's going to do what it wants to do. See, look, in, in this, are you looking in Psalm 107? Look, it says, verse 25, For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. And that's what happens when these guys get on these big boats and all of a sudden the wind comes up and they're up and they're down and they're up and they're down and it's way, and then the waves come and knock people off the ship. It's crazy how powerful the ocean can be. It just beat you to death. And, And then look at verse 27. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. Have you ever seen somebody who's drunk? I've seen more drunk people than I'd like to see. I've seen, have you noticed how they walk? They don't walk straight. That's why if the police find someone, they think they're driving drunk. If they think they're drunk, what do they tell them to do? You know what they t- make them do? They make them walk. And it's a little test, simple little test. Heel to toe, heel to toe, just walk. I probably can't do it. Walk a straight line, and, and a drunk person can't. Because they'll fall all over because they stagger. Well, the, the Bible isn't saying they're drunk. The Bible says on that ship, you say, I'm just going to walk over there. And they're walking like this. and they're, Because that ship is just, you know what I mean? That ship is just rocking them all over. And they realize, I can't control the sea. As long as we're here in, in the, on land... We feel a certain control that we have. We kind of can, you know, we have some control. At least we think we do. But when they go down to the sea in ships, they get out there and they can't see land. And they, all this happens. And they realize God is the only one that can protect me, that can help me. The, the Bible says in verse 28, Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Now, the Bible says they go down to the sea in ships. Let me just say real quick that there's certain things you can make money with with a ship, right? You can, you can haul things with a ship, right? So what are some, I got to thinking, what are some of the ways you can make money with a ship? If you had a big ship, what could you do? Yeah, and I think that primarily three main categories, unless I'm mistaken, I think there's mainly three categories that people would make money. You could go down and take a ship and you could haul cargo, couldn't you? You could load it with something, whatever it is, and take it from here to there, sell the cargo, and people pay you, right, to take your stuff, and you can make money like that. You could transport people. You can put people in your boat and uh, have a cruise line or something, you know, or whatever you have, and we're going to take the people from here to there. And they'll pay you to haul the people. And then there's another way I thought of that people make money with a ship, and that is fishing. Fishing's big business, right? You're either carrying people or, or cargo or you're fishing. And they go out there in these fishing boats, don't they? And they gather all these fish, and, and fish are big money. And out here, you know, we got the Columbia River, right? we got the Pacific Ocean, and we have all these companies. They have crabbing and fishing and salmon. And, and uh, by the way, just to see if this is relatable to you. How many of you like fishing? Does anybody like to fish? Yeah. How many of you have been fishing quite a bit? How many ever caught a fish this big? Come on. I'm so honest in church. All right, whatever. I told my wife, I think, what was it? When did I catch a salmon? Wasn't it two years ago? First salmon, only salmon ever caught. And it was this big, right? See, she keeps saying it wasn't that big, but I'm telling you it was that big. It was a big fish. And I'm not really a fisherman, but I like catching fish. And a lot of you said, right, you like catching fish. And Jesus said, come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And uh, what kind of people did he say that to? Somebody tell me. What, who, what kind of people did he say it to? Fishermen, right? Didn't he say that to fishermen? And, and how many of you know the story where he said, cast your net on the other side? You remember that story? How many of you know that story? Right? So, and they did. They cast it on the other side. And what happened? A lot of fish, right? And the net break. 
right? They had so many fish. And, and Jesus says, come after me. Now, these were fishermen. Jesus said, do it this way, and they caught a lot. Probably the best day they ever had fishing, except for they didn't get them all, except for the ones that got away, right? All, the, all these fish, that was probably the best day they ever had fishing. And what did they do? They left their nets, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus said, if you'll follow me, see, he knows about catching fish, right? He can catch a lot of fish. How many have ever been fishing, never caught anything when you went? More of you raise your hand than people said, I went fishing. That's why you give up, because you go, you get nothing. And you say, I don't like it anymore. That's why I think Gabriel doesn't like fishing, because he wants to catch some. Well, Jesus shows him how to catch fish, and then he says, come after me. I'll show you how to catch men. And he knows how to catch fish. He knows how to catch men, too. And by the way, I really like fishing. I really like catching men. I really like fishing for men. I really like when people get saved. And that's what he was talking about, right? I'm going to show you how to catch people for the kingdom. And that's what he's talking about. Now, if we, if we follow the thinking of the Bible and just common sense here, the Bible says they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. Now, when I caught my salmon, this is my biggest fish story ever, and it's a true story because I have a picture. Wait a minute, my phone got deleted. Do I still have the fish picture? <laughs> I just, I didn't, this isn't in my notes. It just occurred to me. I don't think I have a picture of my fish. <laughs> biggest fish I ever caught. All right, when I caught that fish, I was standing on the beach, and I was throwing out a line, and I hooked that thing, and it broke water. Man, it was awesome. You should have been there, and it was fine. But, you know, to someone who does it for a living, you know what they do? They go in a boat. They go in a boat, and they go out in the water, and they go out deep, and they'll, they'll come back with so many fish. They, I mean, they got fish just busting out the seams of the boat. They've got, and they go out so far you can't even see land. And these people that are, they're people that have charter boats. You know what that is, a charter boat? How many of you have been on a boat fishing? You been on a boat? Okay, one time I went out with a guy that was out in New Jersey. He was a man that was just wanted to be kind to me, and he paid for me to go out on a charter boat. And here's how, how many of you men have been on a charter boat fishing? Okay, that's a lot of fun. Did you get anything? Oh, yeah. See, because when, when you go to get a charter, those are the guys that are the professionals. They got the fish finder, you know. Yeah, fishy, 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 fishy. They know where the fish are at. And they take you out there, and the deal is you, you pay way too much. You pay a lot of money, but they take you out, and they tell you right where to go. And they, they even, a lot of them even do the bait and everything for you, and they have everything ready. And you just sit there, relax, and drink soda, and catch fish. That's all you do. And, and it's a charter. And I went out with this man. He paid for me to go. And we went out and we got rock bass. And we got, I don't even know, lingcod and all kind of fish. And it was just reel them in, buddy. Reel them in. Just one after another. How many of you want to do that? Would that be fun to do that? Yeah. Where you're actually catching them and bringing them in. They that go down to the sea in ships, they do business in great waters. These see the works of the Lord. Jesus said, come after me and I'll make you to become fishers of men. He wants us to go down. Now, anybody... Maybe I'll make an analogy from the Bible. So if you and I went down once in a while, once in a while, and we just met some random person and said, hey, if you die, are you going to heaven or hell? You should practice that. Let's practice that. That's an easy question to ask. People, some people will look at you weird, but some people will stop, and they'll say, I don't know. <coughs> and you'll open up a conversation. Think of, That's an easy question. If you die... Would you go to heaven or hell? Can you practice that? Say it with me. Ready? If you die, would you go to heaven or hell? Say that over and over and over again until it's not weird anymore. And go up to somebody and just ask them that. And don't be scared. I mean, what are, what are they going to do? You know, send you a mail bomb? Probably not. I mean, they just, they might say, oh, I don't care or go away. But they might say, you yeah, know, I don't know. But if you do that, you go out, that's, that's opening a door to witness to tell someone about Jesus, right? How many of you know if you died, you'd go to heaven? How many of you know that's true? Okay, so you got the answer then. You know you could tell somebody. And if you go down and you witness to somebody that way and you say, hey, let me ask you something. If you died, would you go to heaven or hell? And they say, man, I don't know. Well, let me show you what the Bible says. And you start to show them from the Bible how to be saved. And maybe that person 
says, man, I, I want what Jesus did. I want to receive it. How do I get that? And you're going to show them something in the Bible, right? What's a verse you're going to show them? And if someone says, oh, I don't know, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Or something like that. What would you say to them? Anybody help me with that? You got one? A verse? I love to put you on the spot because I'm preaching, so I'll put you on the spot. Anybody got an idea? There's not really a wrong answer. Well, now, there is a wrong answer. There's a lot of right answers. What would you say to them? Man, you stole that out of the Bible. That's exactly what you say to them. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, right? Uh, you could tell in Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Have an answer, right? You have to always be ready to have an answer. But if you and I did that, we went and started the conversation. Hey, what if you died? Would you go to heaven or hell? Ask somebody that this week. I dare you. I double dog dare you. Start, start with somebody you know. Ask your dad. I don't care. Ask somebody. Go up to your mom. Hey, mom, if you die today, would you go to heaven or hell? Practice on them first and then, you know, work your way out. But if you do that, it's almost, and that's a good thing to do, it's almost kind of like going down to the shore with your little fishing line and casting out a line, which is great. But the Bible says they that go down the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord. And, and I think about these fishermen make a lot of money and they catch a lot of fish and they go out deep into deep waters. They go way out. They got a boat. If you meet someone who's got a fishing boat, they're serious about fishing, don't you think? And I said, how many of you have been out on a boat? And not even that many people have been out on a boat. I went on one charter one time, I mean, years ago, and I'm still talking about it. It was a lot of fun. Your church, being a church, as a gospel preaching lighthouse, as a mission work, it's kind of like a big old ship, doesn't it? And together, by having a church, see, Pastor Bond, he told me about how that God had burdened his heart and moved on him to get this property and put a building here. And you say, well, why do you need a building? The building's not even in the Bible, right? Nowhere in the Bible does it say to even buy a building. But he had this idea, man, we, if we had a building. You know what he was doing? He was thinking about going down to the sea in ships. He was thinking about building something big enough. It's nice to go cast a hook in the water and get a little here, fishy, fishy, fishy. You know, it's fun to do that, but isn't it great to go down in a big boat and get the big haul of fish and bring them all in, bring them all in. And I think... I think a local church is like a big old gospel preaching fishing vessel. A big old ship. It takes vision to do something like that. Like, like Brother, Will, Brother William saying, let's go, hey, let's go down there. Was it Guatemala, right? Let's go down there to Guatemala and let's just sell everything. And let's go down there and just, uh, and that, that's, that's an investment right there. You know what they say boat stands for? B-O-A-T. Have you ever heard people around boats? I like boats. I can't afford one. Bring out another thousand. Because they, they say this. They say, well, if you want a boat, it's a big hole that you throw money in. Because boats are expensive. They are. Stuff always breaks on boats. And, you, and a boat thing is more expensive than a car thing. It's just like three times the amount of money. No matter, because, oh, well, it's for a Marine? Okay, well, that'll be $1,000. That's just the way it is. And, you know, when you get into big, big investments in ministry, you say, man, how much is it going to cost to start that church? Bust out another 1000 You know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to cost a lot of money. It's a big investment. You say, well, that should have been done. You know, that, that church should have been, you, you should have 100 people by now. Somebody actually said that to me. You should have 100 people by now. Well, hey, it's better than a church you didn't start. Amen. <laughs> Um, I'd love to have, I thought we'd have a thousand by now, you know, I don't know where they're all at. Still looking for them. It's an investment to go down to in a foreign field. It's an investment. It's a big endeavor. It feels like sometimes when you get out there and you do some big thing and you dream big and you say, hey, let's do this. Let's plant a church. Hey, let's have a gospel tent meeting. Let's, uh, let's advertise all over the place and tell everybody to come in. You get out there and you do stuff like that, and it feels like you're out there so far you can't even see lands. It feels like, man, I haven't got my sea legs yet. Lord, are you sure about this? 
It's a, it's a scary position to put yourself in. You get out there and you think, man, I'm way over my head where I'm at. But that's where you see the works of the Lord. Because you're trusting God to do something really big. You're saying, I, I'm still holding out and believing you're still going to do it. Haven't seen it yet. It's probably, I heard this, I, I was told it's probably somewhere around 40 years. Maybe somebody knows better than I do. Somewhere around 40 years between when Joseph had the dream to where he's in command over Egypt. He had the dream. He grabbed onto the dream. We've not been 40 years since God called me to preach when I was 17. It's not been 40 years. But I believe God wants a church out here in the Northwest. I believe God's going to do it. And say, when are you, you going to quit believing that? Till when I'm dead. And I'll quit believing that. We, we have to latch on. We have to go. We have to go out and do something big. Now, just three simple things that I will, I will give you out of Psalm 107. The ship means you're serious. The ship means you're serious. They that go down to the sand ships, they do business in great waters. You meet someone who's got a fishing pole, okay, he probably likes the fish. You meet someone who's got a boat, a big boat, and he goes out, he's probably a fisherman. He's probably serious about his fishing. Let me ask you this. Do you like to win people to the Lord? Do you like to go soul winning, or are you a soul winner? Is that what you are? Is that what defines you? So the ship means you're serious. They go down to the sea in ships. That's a serious thing. The second thing is they see the works. Look at verse 24. They see the works. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. Do you want to see the works of God? We'll, we'll come back here to Psalm 107 just to follow up on these, on these two points. But look with me quickly at John 14. John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. John 14. And look at verse 12. John 14, 12. Remember I talked about believing in a big God and a Red Sea God and God that can do all kinds of things. Let's not read the Bible like it's Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Okay, Don't read the Bible like it's Rumpelstiltskin. It's not Peter Pan. It's the Bible. It really happened. These are real things that happened. And the Bible says in Luke 9, or excuse me, in, uh, in John 14, 12, verily, verily, and you know that means true, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. How's that even possible? I don't know, but Jesus said it. And when he went away, he left somebody here. He left the Holy Spirit here. And he's given us of the Holy Spirit, the filling and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that we have. We can go see God do some really great works. He wants to see great works. And he's going to let us do that. So if you have the ship, it's more investment. Can I say it this way? The more you invest, the more you produce. If you had one fishing ship that brought in a 1,000 fish, wouldn't two fishing ships bring in 2,000 fish? And the more ships you have, the more, the more you put in, the more you get out. Right? The more you invest, the more you get out. So we haven't seen anything yet. With the works of God, we haven't. There's so much more that God is capable of doing. We just have to believe God will do it, and we have to do it. Here's the other thing I wanted to show you in Psalm 107. Look at verse 30. Look at verse 30. Remember, it, it talked about and how they reel to and fro because of the storm, and they cry to the Lord, and he makes the storm calm. And then in verse 30, it says, Then are they glad because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. There's a song called, I've Anchored My Soul in the Haven of Rest. Uh, a port in German, when we, spoke, we speak German, we lived in Germany for a while, and a port is haven. That's the word, haven. It's haven. It's spelled just like that, and they say haven. It's a port. And in port, you don't have to worry about the storm. In port, you're tied up to the dock. In port, you're, 
And so the Bible says they go, if they go down to the sea in ships, God calms the storm and God brings them back into their haven, into their port, into their, uh, the place that they're trying to go. But we have to go down to the sea in ships. Luke chapter 5, I'll point this out to you. Luke chapter 5. I'm going to read this verse. I'm going to make a point. I'm going to ask my wife to come after that, and we're going to sing a song, and then I'll hand things over to Pastor Seely. But in Luke chapter 5 and verse 4. Now, when he had left speaking, and that's Jesus, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draught. Launch out into the deep. What's he saying? Go out further. Go to the sea and ships. Go out into the deep and get out there further. Go further. Go further. And I don't know when Jesus is coming back, but probably very soon, I think. And we have a little bit of time. It's been 2,000 years. And people are saying, where's the promise of his coming? Oh, you've been saying that. And Paul thought Jesus was going to return in his time. I believe that. And, and every man that hath this hope in him purifies. We're, we're supposed to be looking for that. And I'm, and I'm looking for that. But I really do think it's getting pretty close. I really do. I don't think we have a whole lot of time. And when you read about those churches in Revelation, we don't want to fall out too short. We, we want to go all the way through. You know, one thing Pastor Bond said to me several times, he said, I want to finish well. Did he say that to anybody else? He said that to me. He kept saying, I want to finish well. <coughs> And when I had that opportunity to speak to him, the last time I spoke to him, I said, Brother Bond, you finished well. And he did. He finished well. Didn't compromise. Didn't back up. Didn't slow down. He was full speed all the way to the last day. And he finished well. That's a good example to us. But Jesus is the one that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, right? He went all the way. He finished well. He went all the way to the end. And I just want to say to you and I tonight, let's not be weary and well-doing. Let's finish well. Let's go down. Let's think big. Let's do something big and hope that God will, God will bless if we go down and trust him to do something. And so here's, what, here's my contribution and what the Lord's put on my heart. I don't know if this is a, I think this is a good analogy. Some of you guys will catch this. I don't know how, how many of the kids will catch this. Maybe so, more of the adults will. But look, this, this is what I think we've done. I chartered a boat for you guys, okay? I chartered, I chartered a, a fishing charter, a fisher for men charter. And, and all the work's being done as far as there's a tent going to be set up. And invitations have been sent out. People are praying. You know what I mean? This is like a charter opportunity. There's the charter ship. And we need people to go who say, hey, put me on that charter. I want to go fishing. Is that analogy working for you? You understand? And all the work's been done. And we want people to come to Astoria and just go around and find folks, you know, with weird things hanging out of their face and, you know, crazy hair. You know. We want you to go find these people and go up to them and say, hey, if you died, would you go to heaven or hell? They say during the Welsh revivals, when things were really stirring up in the Welsh revivals, I heard the story of a reporter that had gone in search of the revivals to try to report on it and, and uh, try to tell something about what it was and to report on it. And he, and he went up to somebody on the street and he said, excuse me, can you tell me where the revivals are going on? And he said, right here, mate, right here. It was in the heart of the people. It was a revival. As people pray about an old-fashioned gospel tent meeting, God's working in that story. People are praying. You have an opportunity to go to a city during a week and just go anywhere. Here, here's what I, I heard a comedian one time, and he said, yeah, my dad, we had a big family, a bunch of 10 kids, and he said, my dad used to take us to the store, and we'd go in the store, he'd say, all right, kids, spread out. They can't watch us all. <laughs> you know, the devil has a work that he's doing in that story. It's a dark city. Hey, guys, spread out. They can't watch us all. Amen. Just go out there. And 
the devil's working. He owns that little piece of land. He owns, he's the God of this world. But if you and I, we go out there and we just start witnessing, man, the devil's been throwing everything he can at our family, at our church. At every, he's been using everything he can. But, hey, he can't watch us all. So here's an opportunity, and I want you to pray. How many of you will pray for our tent meeting? Will you do that? We'll appreciate it. Pray during the, if you can't make it out there, pray during that time. They that go down to sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord. Wouldn't you love to see God do something really big? Really big? I'm going to ask my wife to come as a song I'd like to sing, and then I'll ask Pastor Steve to come. It's an analogy, but you know the Bible uses analogies. That's why he said, I'll make you become fishers of men. Because he was talking to fishermen who understood what that was like and what that meant. Let me tell you that you don't know what God's doing. The first year we held the old-fashioned gospel tent meeting, we had one person that we counted as saved. Pastor Darren House actually preached that night. A man named Timothy gave his heart to the Lord. And he never did stick, if you want to put it that way. In other words, we've not seen him around. He never did even come to church. But he said he heard in the apartments behind the field, he heard the singing and the preaching, and he said he felt drawn to come to the place. He felt like he needed to go there, and he came and he heard the preaching, and he came up after the service made a profession of faith. And I, and I believe it's very possible Timothy got saved. We counted that as one. That was the first year. The second year, we had three that made a profession of faith. Praise the Lord. And, and I keep thinking, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? How much effort would you want someone to go through for your soul to save your soul from hell? And then this year, we don't know. We're probably going to have a 1,000 saved. I'd like to see that. I don't know. what It's in the Lord's hands, isn't it? We want to see God do something big. But let me tell you what happened a couple weeks ago. We were preparing some music, went to the church. I met with some friends that had come from Vancouver. We were practicing some things. Pastor Harley Waite, who's across the river from us, uh, he had told me that he wanted to have a meeting. Uh, he wanted me to go to the hospital and make a, a visit. And I had forgotten about it. I forgot about it. And so he called me, and we were practicing music. He called me and said, hey, did you want to make that meeting? And I, and I said, yeah. I had a little hesitation in my voice. And he said, hey, brother, if you've got things going on, that's fine. I said, well, what's the meeting? He said, well, there's a lady, and she's been to your tent meeting, the first one you had. And he said, she speaks German, and she has been given a short time to live because of a cancer diagnosis. And I said, I'm coming right now. All those things, I just couldn't walk away from that. So I went to the hospital with Pastor Wade, and 45 minutes later, and the lady told me, she said, I went to that meeting, and she said, something really changed in my heart. She said, I've been really thinking about that. And there in the hospital, that lady prayed and asked Jesus to save her. Amen. Amen. Now that's two years later. And we have no idea. But let's go down and do something big. I'm going to sing this song. My wife and I have sung this quite a bit. I learned it from my dad. It's a song that says, Jesus pilots my ship. The soul of man is like a ship that sails. Storms may come, the winds may blow, and rock this ship of mine. But the reason my ship will never sink, and today it's still afloat. My compass is his precious word, and Jesus pilots my boat. And I won't sail these stormy seas no more unless Jesus leaves. Sure, I can't hear what he has to say. I belong to a fleet of sails today on a glorious one-way trip. We'll land safely on shore to sail no more, for Jesus pilots my ship. My soul pulled into safety's port, my stern was torn apart. Badly crushed, 
brother. Well, let's stand together, please. Turn to 485. Revive us again. Revive us again. We need revived. We need to get busy for the Lord. Amen. 485. to uh, uh, bless another church this week with our endeavors. We have been praying for you, brother. We've got you on our, our prayer list, and, and as soon as I found out what the dates were, we put you on our, our prayer list. We pray uh, every day. is a church-wide prayer time at 6.30 in the evening, every day except Wednesday, of course, because everybody's on their way here, and we're, we're going to pray here anyway. So we've been praying for you. We trust the Lord is going to do great things, and we have an opportunity, church, to be to be a physical blessing as well so if we if we can find the time i i want us to go out there and participate and lord and uh, lord willing uh pass out some tracks and share christ with others uh is there any we need to go to the lord in prayer right now for for this endeavor but also pray for our church tonight is wednesday night prayer time instead of our normal thing that we do i'm just going to pray uh up here uh and then we'll we'll close the service is there anything on your heart that we need to be praying for uh, and lift up before the Lord? Sister Sarah, of course, in the hospital right now. 
She's, she's the one on my heart. Anything else? Yes. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Her, uh, Sister Vanessa's brother Michael received their mother's handwritten Bible a lot better than uh, they had expected. So praise the Lord for that and keep praying for his salvation. Anyone else? Uh, Sister Dorcas, uh, as far as I know, she, she was able to buy another moped uh, after that after the burglary they, burglary they had. Um, I believe she's now got everything restored that was stolen, a phone, the moped, and the, the oil. Um, so she's very thankful for, for the, the gifts from the church. So praise the Lord we were able to meet the need there. Anything else? That right. Uh, the, the former pastor had issues with, well, his relations had issues. So we'll put it that way.